Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. Today we have a guest speaker Dr. Jokin M. Schwang from KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Dr. Jokin will talk to us about affinity proteomics which is a field of proteome analysis based on use of antibodies and other binding reagents as protein specific detection probes. He also talk about the study of human plasma proteome using affinity based methods which could enhance biomarker discoveries, validation and integration from basic research towards the clinical usage. He will then talk about the resources like Biobank Sweden and Atlas Antibody. Dr. Jokin will also talk about mass spectrometry technique and how it can be used to study post translation modifications PTM peptides in a digested sample. He will then talk about PTM scan technology which allows identification and quantification of hundreds to thousands of even the lowest abundant peptides and provides a more focused approach to peptide enrichment than the other available strategies. So, let us welcome Dr. Jokin for his lecture. What I would like to talk about today is to give you a bit of a different perspective on what, what we do and what we understand by doing plasma proteomics and maybe there are some aspects of it that could be helpful for you and that sort of provide some ideas of either collaboration or you know for you just to get the new perspective on, on in your projects and how to move forward. Um, so this is my team, uh, so we're currently about yeah, 10 people and it's actually Kimi, the person is, she's half Japanese to the left who, who made this painting, she's very sort of skilled in arts. Um, but I think it's also a nice way of sort of, you know, illustrating us in sort of one group of people with sort of the same phenotype, right? Uh, even though, you know, uh, we have Philippa, she's from the UK, we have Mungwan, he's from, the, he's from Korea, we have uh, Ragnar, she's a, po a postdoc from Germany, we're a very international group. Uh, now actually we have a new person from Denmark. So it's really sort of, you know, the mix of cultures and mix of backgrounds that I think is really sort of important. So um, I guess Frederick has talked to you last week about these different aspects of the human proteome atlas. So the, the tissue-based atlas, the subcellular atlas, as well as the pathology atlas. So I'm going to leave you with that and I hope you still remember some, some elements of it. So I will talk a bit more about sort of what's actually outside of the cell. So talking a bit about the plasma proteome as we see it and then how to use affinity-based methods for studying the plasma proteome. I will give you some examples of how we use uh, mass spectrometry, but the pr predominant part will be actually on, on looking at uh, plasma proteins with affinity reagents. So uh, as Sanjeev alluded to, I'm the current chair of the Human Plasma Proteome Project, and whatever that means is sort of, you know, to be defined, but I think what it sort of is meant to be is sort of an organization that tries to give an, a global understanding of what are the initiatives that people are working on in the different areas of the world and with a common feature of studying the plasma proteome. And I'm doing this together with Eric Deutsch, who is a famous biomathematician from Seattle, as well as Era Ignatovich from Australia. Uh, so really trying to you know, have this as a global initiative too. So about two years ago, uh, we published this paper in the annual uh, special issue of JPR and we are actually in the process of preparing a new uh, sort of uh, review for the coming issue uh, where we basically concluded that there are about 5,000 proteins that we can detect using proteomics methods in plasma, which is probably, you know, 25% of what the genome actually tells us there is. Uh, of course, this is predominantly driven by the fact that these are the things we can measure. It doesn't mean that these are the things that actually are useful, okay? So, given that you know you have new technologies such as somalogic who claim that they can measure 5000 proteins this is within the ballpark of what we see at the moment mass spectrometry in combination with other affinity based assays can measure and there's of course one intrinsic challenge to using you know, for instance mass spectrometry and that is one is of course you need to have a good detection system and protocols to increase the coverage so from around 1,000 proteins, which we could identify some 10 years ago, you know, I think we have made a big step forward in detecting more. And this is also shown here by the charge uh, 
this Venn diagram showing the pro progress. There are also interesting numbers here highlighted in red, which are those proteins which actually sort of got introduced over the, over the uh, recent years. And it's particularly, I think you have these two ga gaps between 2010 and 2013. But there are also about 700 proteins which disappeared from these lists, and meaning that these are proteins that have probably been misannotated and uh, probably glycosylation forms that have been sort of led to the false identification. So I guess, you know, we're not at the end of sort of having the perfect system together, but I think we have a much better understanding of what the system looks like. Another challenge in mass spectrometry is, of course, the coverage, meaning how many proteins do you in your single experiment actually can measure. And this is shown here. Again, we have a time chart on the x-axis, and this is the number of proteins identified on the y-axis. You see there's, of course, a progress being made over the years that you can measure nowadays, let's say, routinely about 500 proteins in every experiment. But you can also see that there's a quite substantial span. In some uh, studies, people claim to have identified 2,000, where most recently, you know, some studies have only measured about 100. So it's really a matter of defining what, what do you call a protein to be and whether it should be identified in only one or in every sample of your measurement. And that brings me to the next sort of point is that if you look at the concentration distribution, so this is just basically here the rank based on abundance, uh, um, you see that you know, predominantly, uh, sorry, this is the rank of abundance and this is the number of times we actually observe this protein in one of the 150 studies we looked at is there's a clear correlation between those proteins which are high abundant are seen more frequently than those proteins that are low abundant. Which also comes to the point that, yeah, now we can measure about two, uh, 500 proteins in every study, but really the question is how many times do we actually see this in every sample? I mean, this has one thing to do with the, the concentration, but it also may have to do with the variants or the isoforms of particular proteins. Uh, it was quite interesting for me you know, to see that for the f uh, four most, most common or most frequent proteins, albumin, I guess that's to be expected, uh, complement factor 4, alpha 2 microglobin or haptoglobin, you did not have all the peptides seen in all studies. So which means that some peptides for albumin are in some studies so unique that they're not common and concordant with other studies. So again, you know, here we come to the point that there's much more information in the peptides that we actually currently so I think using. The next point really to make is about quality and I talked to some of you about you know the challenges of you know the information that you actually observe and, and Sandyeva and I discussed you know the really having the important connection with the clinician obtaining the sample so you have actually control or at least a better understanding what happened to the sample when it was taken. Uh, because if you just think about blood I mean basically you can sort of dissect it into three elements. You have, of course, the cells, you have some, some microparticles uh, or also lipid vesicles, and then you have something which we call sort of the cell-free component, which is sort of serum and plasma. And given that there are lipids that, of course, are also important uh, to be considered, you know, if you just look at the proteins, the reason why you have the proteins in plasma could either be that they're actually actively secreted into blood because of the process that is related to it, or they can be cellular cellular uh, sort of, of cellular origin, meaning either they've sort of been leaking out when the sample was being prepared, or they've been shed from the surfaces because of the a certain a protease has basically took care of it. But there's also an important element which means that samples could be introduced into blood because of the preparation. So meaning you even have intracellular proteins which by changing the temperature from 37 to let's say 23 or 28 here in India, <laughs> You, you may just you know, introduce some of the inflammatory uh, cells to, to secrete uh, cytokines because of the change of environment. And that may have nothing to do with how the system uh, sort of has been before. Um, so what we really advocate importantly is in, in particular when you do these large scale projects is that of course you want to know about the patient, we call it a donor, it's more sort of general. Uh, of course, you want to know how old, what gender, what the diagnose uh, at, at, at the sample collection was. But you also need to think about where the sample comes from. So when was it collected, the location, how old was, uh, how long was the sample being frozen, has it been freeze-thawed and so forth. So it's really about the standardization of the procedures and, and obtaining information about the samples that you're analyzing. So that, I think, is really a, a key.
Uh, and there are a lot of initiatives in Europe that, you know, trying to understand and trying to develop a pipeline for sample processing and handling samples. Because if you just do plain statistics without even sort of been thinking about proteomics, if you want to claim a sort of a significant finding, and this is here just doing a simulation where we, I think, uh, took one of the major risk factors of cardiovascular disease with a power of uh, 0.05, 80% uh, and an alpha of 0.05, in order to just measure that one analyte, you need to have about you know, 80 samples per group. So it's 160 samples in total. If you think about a proteomics experiment, let's say uh, 1,000 or 10,000, you need to have up to 250, 300 samples per group. So meaning you're starting a, um, your measurement to be sort of relevant, if I may use that word, when you have, have 600 or more samples. So this is not always possible. Some diseases, you know, they are, they are not that frequent, so it's going to be extremely challenging to get up to that number. But of course, you know, to get a really understanding about the diseases, that is one way of moving forward. So there's a whole science behind sample preparation variables, or pre-analytical uh, variables, as we usually call it, uh, where people you know, really try to understand what is the quality of sample. And I think Matthias Mann's group has a recent paper on bioarchives where they sort of, you know, looked at where they basically try to you know, separate plasma <laughs> and did sort of different centrifugation uh, uh, segments and removed cells and re-spiked them in to really see what is the contribution of cellular uh, contamination in, in blood. So I think that's an important aspect because uh, cellular contamination is a, is a factor that can hardly be controlled. So what we mostly work with, and this is what I'm going to talk in the second part of my talk, but I have some more slides in between, is, is how we're going to use different affinity-based methods to study the plasma proteome. And there are, I think this is predominantly driven by, by companies nowadays selling kits. Uh, it's a bit different to what the mass spectrometry field is doing, where companies selling instruments, and then this academic environment that has to take care of them. So, of course, you have, you know, uh, I think um, Biogenesis or some other companies that sell or MRM proteomics that, you know, sell you kits. But I think there's no company that sells a kit for doing shotgun proteomics. So, so I guess, you know, it's, it's a bit of a different ballgame because you have, you have a dependency on these, on these companies. But the interesting thing about, you know, using affinity reagents in comparison to mass spec is that, and here's a comparison about the proteins you can identify. Uh, in mass spec as well as in immuno assays, is that you have a lot of the low abundant or annotated low abundant proteins that are actually measurable in immune assays compared to st many structural elements which predominantly may originate from actually cells that are in your plasma uh, that which you can measure in mass spec. Of course, in mass spec, most often, and this is uh, done purely on, on, on shotgun data, is you of course take all the information you get. Whereas in affinity-based assays, you pre-select what you want to look for, right? So, I mean, these are really sort of conceptually different, different approaches. And another aspect I mentioned before is really sort of the, the use of genetic data in combination with protein data. So, how much information about your proteins is already given in your genome? Well, of course, we know that that is where the basic information lies, but how much of that information is actually being connected to what the proteins do at the end. I mean, we have a whole machinery between the genetic and the proteomic information, but surprisingly, you know, and this is a study that, for instance, Somalogic has been done, you know, surprisingly there are a lot of, uh, a lot of um, indications that the, your genes or the, the variants of your genes tell a lot about the proteins that you measure in, in your sample, in blood. So, you know, if you know somebody's genotype, and if you know that genotype would be linked to a higher or lower risk of a certain disease, and you know that genotype is also linked to a so-called PQGL, so uh, quantitative trait loci, then you can say, well, that person always had a high risk of that particular disease. Always the protein level was low, which was maybe, you know, and then a slight increase of a low protein level may actually mean much more then if you would have the inverse case where a, pro a person has a low risk but has intrinsically high level of a certain protein, right? So it's really important to include much, much more data and I mean proteogenomics as one of the approaches but others, I mean, you know, following the way so it's really 
uh, and this is actually one of the resources built by by uh, um, Carsten Sure, who is of oops, collecting all this information. So it will be, a, I think, a growing part in many of the proteomic study because if you don't know why a person has a higher level, you know that might be one of the reasons for it. So uh, I've been involved in a couple of mass spectrometry-related um, projects. This is one that's led by Jan Lechtio's group. So they have used this high reef system, so they have basically isoelectric focusing as a pre-preparation uh, concept, and then sort of did fractionation. And what what we show in this study that we can you know detect a thousand proteins across all the 30 donors we've been using in this study. Um, interestingly, we could also what, what we have done is compare the baby, newborn baby, to the mother, and we can see that there are you know, many proteins are alike between the two, but there are some which are only seen in the baby, some are only seen in the mother, and we also see that there are some proteins that basically traverse the placenta, so are being transferred from one location to another, and this could only be done using actually a proteogenomics approach, where we know the variants that are sort of um, uh, expressed by the baby versus the variants that are only expressed by the mother. So this I think will be a very important example and hopefully will be coming out in a couple of weeks time. Um, so we're resubmitting this uh, uh, as we speak. Um, I think it will be a very important sort of element. What we also done, and, and it's again using the protein atlas as a resource. So the protein atlas had, has, of course, produced these atlases. It has produced antibodies, but it has also produced a lot of antigens. And I guess Peter Nielsen, maybe some of you have met, talks a lot about using the antigens for quality assurance of antibodies or using these antigens for autoimmunity profiling. What we're nowadays using is using these antigens as heavy standards for targeted mass spectrometry. And the reason is because we have these constructs, so here you have the endogenous protein, and then we select these unique regions we call prests. And all these prests, by default, carry a tag which we initially used for protein purification. But nowadays, and this is basically the representation, this is a fantastic tag to do quantification of that specific sort of standard, right? Because this is a common tag for all the standards we use in our system. And you can use this, of course, for all your mass spec retention time adjustments and so forth, so what have you. And now we've done this for about 25,000 of these protein, uh, for these uh, Q-Prests, as we call it. The paper is also on by archives and hopefully will be coming out in a couple of weeks' time. Um, but, I mean, you know, using this, this as a pipeline that we can actually, you know, use that information to specifically build <coughs> off-the-shelf targeted proteomics assays for the proteins we're interested in. And we've shown this for a couple of examples uh, also in plasma now in this study that Frederick has been heading. So <laughs> the main part of my talk is, is about sort of what, what do we do sort of as sort of our core business, if that would be sort of a pitch to the four investors. Uh, so the core, uh, core is actually we, use, we do affinity-based <coughs> plasma proteomics. And that means that you know, we use antibodies or different types of affinity agents if they are available for doing protein profiling. Uh, we care a lot about the study design. I think this is something I touched upon before. We care a lot about antibody validation. This has been a sort of a hot topic for us because antibodies have been criticized massively. Uh, there has always, uh, as in these constellations, been some truth to it. But I think we believe that there are opportunities to change the, the, uh, the perception. And in parts, it has to do is redefining or explaining more or less what the antibody is actually capable of. Right? So an antibody is not an off-the-shelf universal tool that will solve all your problems. Right? An antibody is something you need to know where to use it and for what to use it. Right? So an antibody good for Western blood may not work in immunosystem chemistry or ELISA. That is an understanding that not many people have, unfortunately. Um, so my lab currently runs three different sort of technologies. So we use Luminex as sort of our go-to platform because it's open access for us. We have all their equipment. We have 10 years of experience of using it in various aspects for protein as well as autoantibody profiling. It's for us sort of really easy to use, uh, but it has some limitations in terms of sort of in the way we use it, quantification and, and, uh, and, and um, 
sensitivity. We also, for about two years now, have Olink as a technology that we run, and we do this for different types of service projects or our own research projects. And we also have an interesting technology offered by Protein Simple, which uses microfluidics. Uh, and the nice thing with this system, it's basically uh, almost fully automated. So you don't have any user interference, and that gives you really excellent batch-to-batch -batch, uh, precision. And it actually is a system that we think could be useful for clinicians because they don't want to think about how to run the experiment. They just want to get the data. Right? We're also going to inc in, uh, include Quanterix as a new technology, probably someone doing this year. And Quanterix is, is basically also a bead-based ELISA sim uh, or a bead-based uh, immunoassay system just like uh, Luminex. But they have a different way of readout in terms of that they use an enzyme to uh, to create uh, chemical fluorescence, and they also have a different mode of detecting or counting their detection, meaning that instead of you know measuring the sum of all signals that are sort of obtained, they actually do they call it digital counting. So they they count the number of particles which actually emit a light at a certain uh, uh, level, and that, that's what they usually call sort of their sort of digital amplification range, which is sort of then giving them a hundredfold uh, improved sensitivity at the cost of uh, using more samples and more antibodies, which is not as well communicated. Um, so, of course, then there's a whole portfolio of sort of options, which technology to use, and, and this is usually when we have uh, uh, sort of meetings with users of the facility that I'm directing, you know, what do you want to do? What is the specificity, the cost, the number of targets? Do you want quantification? How many samples do you have available? What are the volumes and so forth? So it, it's really sort of a ballpark of different features that you need to consider when you choose a certain method for your application. Which again, you know, is a bit of a different concept to mass spec, given that you, know, you can probably choose many systems for many applications, right? Of course, you need to tweak them, and some may be less suitable than others, but in theory, I guess, you, from all mass spec, you would get some data out, right? <laughs> yeah, I mentioned antibody validation. This is really, I think, a key uh, challenge that we are facing. Uh, but again, what, what I've been you know, preaching for uh, some time now, and this is sort of my tagline in, in this context, is the performance and selectivity of antibodies are application and context dependent, right? So it's the matter of the application, meaning Western blot or ELISA. It's the, the way that you prepare your sample, that you prepare uh, your, your assay um, so that you actually get the best out of it. Um, we've been working on, on, on using actually mass spec as a readout for, for immunocapture data. And this is, I guess, most, of, most often done you know, using uh, um, cellular systems or where you have actually a tag, uh, an antibody towards a tag, and the tag is fishing out a protein which has been introduced, and uh, people you know, calling sort of the crap ohm, you know, the, all the proteins you identified, even though they don't have anything to say. So we've been putting uh, all of this into, into plasma, and this is a study led by Claudia. Uh, so here we've done uh, more than 400 uh, uh, IPs. And, and build sort of a library of data to, to judge whether an antibody specifically enriched a protein in plasma or not. And these are the sort of these, these sort of enrichment plots. So to the left you have you know, this crap ohm, the part that is commonly found in, in every enrichment, and that may be due to you know, uh, protein sticking to the beads. But then to the right hand side, you know, we chose the Z score of three as a cutoff. You see some, some on-target detection, you see some co-targets, meaning proteins are co-enriched, either because they have a similar sequence or they actually do interact, which we find very interesting. We also see you know, off-target interactions to proteins that are more abundant than the protein that we um, presume the antibody would bind to. And we actually also have cases where we have no target, meaning there's no specific enrichment. So which I think in a way is interesting because either this could mean that if there is an enrichment that the target has not been sort of detected in mass spec or the protein that you know is simply too low abundant to be sort of um, uh, reaching a set score that is of relevance. Yeah, as I mentioned, protein interactions we find interesting. Here we know for this uh, insulin uh, growth factor binding family, they sort of interact with another. And as shown here, and using the string database, you have IGF-BP2 interacting with IGF-1 and 2. 
And as you can see here, using three different antibodies, we could see here's IGF that they actually interact. But we also could claim new interactors with this BCA, uh, uh, HE as well as DRI as proteins that are relevant for this, for these complexes. Uh, what we also do, you know, and sort of going back to our sort of um, most uh, accessible technology is using Luminex. And here, uh, Ragnar has, uh, you know, screened more than 200 antibodies, uh, sorry, 200 proteins using more than 600 antibodies to find which are actually suitable sandwich pairs. So using both for capture and detection. This is also now a paper which you can find on BioArchives and hopefully um, uh, the reviewers will like it. Uh, so we've done sort of, you know, a, a, a sort of a long-term procedure doing two screening rounds. I mean, this is a substantial amount of work with a couple of people involved. But at the end of the day, sort of it led us to this triangular chart here where we actually looked at longitudinal samples and the precision the assay provides in this context. So it's a bit of uh, difficult to read, but basically we looked at sort of what is the variance of the assay in terms of the technical precision, what is the difference between the individuals that we observe uh, um, over time, and what is the difference between the individuals themselves, right? And as you can see, we have a couple of nice proteins here, those ones that we high in uh, uh, highlight in, in, in green, which are those proteins that are, we can measure precisely, that are stable over time, but they vary a lot between the individuals, meaning that there's probably a genetic component or some sort of personalized component to it that makes these proteins more interesting than others. Again, we do, took a lot of effort to do validation, and here's just some sort of correlation chart where we compare the different sandwich acid data, here in this case for a protein called, I think it's CCL16. We have uh, three different assays we developed in-house, and this is the assay offered by Olink, so we have a pretty good precision in using completely different, so this is Olink is a solution phase um, um, protein, uh, proximity extension assay, whereas you know, we have a classical ELISA where you capture on a bead, you wash, and then you add your detection antibody. So our, our main workhorse has for many years been these antibody bead arrays. Uh, so, so we really use sort of the high multiplexing capacity of the Luminex system. We have a couple of liquid handling devices to do upfront sort of sample prep. Uh, so here the, the idea is that you, uh, instead of using two antibodies, you basically, you know, label your sample like you do in, 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 in different types of TMT assays. Uh, and then you sort of have a bead array which has 384 different antibodies. You fish out the proteins that you can find in the solution and then you use biotin to detect whether the antibody has enriched the protein of interest. Uh, we've been working a lot on sort of, you know, getting the data uh, analysis and processing right, and it's done by mainly Mung Guan, who's a researcher in my group, and we have a pretty good idea about the data, the precision, and sort of the accuracy, and this is, these are sort of two T-SNE plots showing basically the same uh, data, but here basically this is, these are the replicates where all the other data points are samples taken uh, from the same individuals every third month over a period of one year. And you can also maybe see that you know, all these individuals actually cluster together. So uh, show, using our data, and, you know, we know the phenotype or the, the plasma proteome phenotype that we measure is constant over time using, using our data. So we've been involved in a couple of larger and, and I think actually growingly larger projects which you know, we try to have multiple study sets, meaning samples coming from more than one location. Uh, using more antibodies, actually building our, uh, our um, own sandwich immune assays. For those candidates, we identify to use immunocapture mass spectrometry as a way to validate. We still have Western blood sometimes as a go-to option, but it's actually less relevant nowadays for our approaches. We do validation of antibodies using peptide or protein arrays. Um, sometimes this is helpful to, the, to certify the selectivity between different off-target candidates. And more, I think, interestingly for us in the future will be to do this PQTL, sort of the GWAS analysis to understand what is the genetic component behind these, these studies that, we've, that we're performing. Um, so, so these are two of these initiatives. One is a wellness project, which is headed by Matthias and Joran Backstrom, uh, where we've taken those 100 subjects, did all the different omics and clinical uh, um, measurements uh, where we looked at them every third month over the course of one year. I'm also part of a very large EU project with different pharma companies and clinicians from all over Europe to do basically the, 
the same or a similar type of uh, molecular clinical and, and, and environmental phenotyping uh, in the context of uh, pre-diabetes and, and, and diabetes progression. And again, an important aspect for us are these four elements. So it's a study design, how, how do we sort of proceed in terms of you know, randomization? How do we get the number of samples right? How do we do the discovery? I mean, we have to choose which are the interesting candidates because we make that pre-selection. How do we do antibody validation or actually building new assays for target validation? And then to you know, go back and sort of study new samples again to prove that our hypothesis is actually valid. Um, so one of the studies we've done here on bioetric surgery. So bioetric surgery is a major type of in, uh, intervention for, for people that are very obese and at usually are at high risk of di diabetes. So the idea is that th this uh, surgery induces weight loss and along with weight loss comes that the patient is not longer defined as being diabetic. Uh, and we want to understand whether proteins in plasma can give us an indication about uh, either will a patient, you know, be uh, benefiting from that surgery. That's sort of, we're looking at remission, uh, which is uh, done uh, using a multi-omics approach by one of the postdocs in my group. But also, how do, how do proteins change over time pre and post surgery? So because we have looked at the patients at baseline, and, uh, as well as um, um, following surgery. And we actually could see that there are a couple of proteins, sorry, that are consistently increasing, knowing that there's an individual variance, uh, consistently increasing post-surgery, and we looked at three months as a time window, because between zero and the three months, there's a lot of processes that are sort of overruling sort of the, the phenotypes we are interested in. Uh, in particular those that are re uh, related to wound healing, right? So if you measure a patient after, the day after the surgery, a lot of the things you measure is actually the patient responding to the surgery, not responding sort of on a metabolic level. Uh, and we could interesting, interestingly see, you know, some proteins actually sort of do change also in, in sort of the opposite direction, which means that they're actually decreased in abundance. Uh, another type of uh, multi-omics approach we've done in the context of unstable atherosclerosis. So here you have basically the, the, the coronary plugs that, you, uh, uh, that some people develop. And of course there's a risk that some are stable, uh, uh, some are unstable, which means that you might actually or have a higher risk of, of, of stroke and heart attack. So with this, uh, a group of clinicians who've done sort of uh, microarray and qPCR, identified a couple of candidates which they could validate in, in using mass spec in tissue. We then took on this type of target and actually could validate uh, the same sort of observation using either the suspension bead array, the screening approach, as well as we build a sandwich assay to measure that same difference in, in plasma samples. So we really sort of brought from sort of early DNA, RNA detection down to sort of applications in plasma. We also did a large-scale study on, on, on mammographic density. So this is a study, again, we're sort of switching a bit sort of disease areas here. Um, it's, it's, it's related to, to cancer, and in particular uh, is a risk factor for, for uh, women in, in the Western world. So if you lose density in your breast post-menopause, it's actually a very good protective indication. But if the stiffness of the breast stays after menopause, there's a high risk of breast developing breast cancer. But nobody understands what is this density. And we try to find, using association study uh, on, on a cohort of about 1,200 women, uh, whether we could identify features that are consistent. And, and we found a couple of uh, interesting protein relate, proteins related to the extracellular matrix, as well as to, uh, um, to um, proliferation levels that could indicate you know, that there's actually a loss and increase in density uh, visible in the plasma proteome. Um, again, sort of one aspect that we have been working on frequently is this longitudinal profiling. And here I again want to bring up uh, something I mentioned earlier, which is sort of how consistent can you actually measure a protein. So here we've looked at basically this, we correlated the data we generated for this protein across this, these four visits. And we see that you know, the protein is pretty, uh, the measurement is pretty stable over time. 
But then if we look, if you compare the data between the visits, you can see, yeah, okay, here we have extremely high precision as well. So meaning that protein can be accurately measured and it's very stable over time. The second protein here is again, we sort of replicated this assay a couple of times and you can see the precision of the measurement is very good. But if you look at the correlation of the biological variation, as we call it, where you compare those data uh, measured at visit two versus visit one and so forth, there's basically zero correlation, which means each, each blood collection introduces a factor which cannot be replicated, right? And of course, if you have a biomarker, you know, which looks like this on a technical scale, but if it's impossible to replicate because it is, and this protein we know is part of the uh, skeleton, uh, part of the uh, smooth muscle system, so we know it's actually in coming from puncturing uh, your, your skin and the vein. But again, it, you know, it's the protein you would not have sort of considered, but you can actually measure it. We also looked at seasonal fluctuations. So this is, of course, interesting, you know, in the sense that what are the differences if you measure your protein during winter compared to during summer? And may just be the season have an effect on your protein levels. And just assuming, let's say, this would be sort of a, a cutoff level for this protein here, you know, here you would be actually above cutoff and the doctor may say, oh, we may need to check up on you a bit more. While as during summer, you know, you actually have a much lower level. So, of course, these parameters, which also, I mean, relate back to the time point and the age of the sample uh, are important things you need to consider when you do your measurement. I'm going to finish uh, with this project. So this is also something which hopefully will be coming out in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, we've received some very good comments from the first round of re review that we'll be certainly able to manage to handle this. So what we've done here is basically, uh, this is a study, uh, it's been a bit, a bit of a hobby study actually, because in most, most of the projects we have, we know the age of the person which donates the sample. So we just started to collect a you know, couple of studies uh, and actually now it's, it ended up to be, uh, it's actually 4,000 in total. Uh, where we actually looked at the same or the, uh, same protein over and over again. And as you can see here, in all these studies, the slopes may be different, but in all these studies, we could see a consistent increase in trend over time. So basically, sort of using this as a, as a, as a, as a additional passenger in the different studies, we sort of, you know, as a byproduct, more or less, found a protein which is associated with age. And we, and we've been validating this, and this is the meta-analysis that we did. So the p-value is, I think, uh, far better than most studies you've, you've, uh, you've seen uh, because it's really consistent uh, across time. And, and what we also looked at is what, I mean, it's one thing that this protein HRG tells you about, about your age, uh, but it also tells you much more about the risk of dying. So it seems that elevated levels of this protein increases your risk of dying compared to low levels, specifically eight, up to eight and a half years prior to death. And this is sort of on an uh, all-cause mortality. So it's not linked to any particular uh, um, um, cause of death, like cancer or cardiovascular disease. Of course, we did a lot of, uh, we did a lot of uh, validation of the antibodies. We actually also took uh, do, did GWAS, and this is actually the protein array that we've run with Peter's group. So these are 20,000 spots, and you can only see a single peak of this antibody, which was quite surprising. Uh, but you know, we know it's we know we can measure HRG, and and but then what we actually also did, uh, and this is fairly new uh, for us, is again we took this genetic information we had about these individuals. And there was another antibody against the same target. And when we correlated the slope, so meaning what you do in, in these PQTLs, you basically have a bo box plot with three different groups. So, it, so it's the AA, TA, or uh, AT genotype. And then, just, and then you just uh, superimpose sort of a, a trend. And what we could see that these two antibodies, they have the exactly same uh, list of PQTLs they have an opposite trend in their association. And that's also seen here by these uh, um, distribution plots, meaning sort of the, the red genotype is lower for this antibody 
whereas the red genotype is higher for this antibody. Right. So it's completely new data. Nobody has, nobody has done something like this before. But what it says, we have not really fully understood, but what we believe right now is that every person has a particular variant of that protein and that the antibodies have a particular affinity to that protein variant. So we think, and it's likely, that many proteins we nowadays study, we don't actually, they don't actually in reality differ in concentration. They just differ in the variant they are. And that the different methodologies, may it be mass spec or affinity-based assays, just think or just report different signals because it's a different variant. And I guess it's a particular challenge for both assay types in mass spec because when you look at the libraries that you use to match your data, this is, this is done on canonical sequences. Of course, you can do proteogenomics approaches, but that's not always possible. But it will be in the future because you need to have that understanding to know what to, what to look after. Right? And it's the same thing for affinity assays. If a small variant, if you have an exchange, let's say you would change a hydrophib uh, hydrophilic amino acid and you have a, a non-synonymous uh, mutation, meaning that that suddenly becomes, from serine, you change to a proline, you, know, you will change the behavior of that protein either in the way it's been recognized in your test or how it actually interacts with other proteins and thereby may be more accessible for, let's say, you know, different types of measurements. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention um, and, yeah, of course, all these people. In summary, today you have studied the human plasma proteome using affinity based methods which could enhance biomarker discovery, validation and integration from basic research towards clinical usage. How Atlas Antibody from HPA project can help us in getting detailed understanding and background of the affinity based methods. Dr. Jokin also provided a brief understanding about GVAS and how patient information is important to understand data set variations. In the next lecture, we will listen a clinician Dr. Sachin Jadho who will talk to us about clinical considerations for omics studies. Thank you. <music>